So this is not a static balance, it's actually mobile. The image, the picture that should leap out to us is not temporal, it's not stuck to this one lifetime. It has to do with this essential core of our being. One thing that all these characters have in common is that they're all connected with Benedictus as a teacher, either directly or indirectly. Um, and I have a last preparatory thought before I actually go into the play, and I will do that. Um, Waldorf teachers know this. I only learned it in the last year because I'm on the board of the Pendleton Waldorf School, and somehow I'm preparing something for that. I I learned that Rudolf Steiner said that all education, and he said that really, all education is self-education. That's very powerful. It's not just children, it's mm -hmm. all of us. We are self-educating. We are, it is our, you, a teacher can prepare the conditions for learning for the children, but if the children don't take it up, they can't learn. And it's the same with us. It's our inner impulse to learn that is what is enabling us to learn. So all of these characters, who the human characters who are striding forward and backward and doing what they're doing, they are all in a process of self-education. Now I'm going to turn to, I'm going to share with you what I think is, I think it's the biggest mystery in the mystery dramas. For me, it was just like, how is it that Johannes, who has everything that I'm striving for, right? he's this talented artist, he also wrote a book, he's, you know, he, he, he studied for years with Capesius, he's a regular meditant, he has clairvoyant experiences. He already knows a number of his past lives. He has personal access to a living initiate in private conversations. <laughs> <laughs> he, he recognizes spiritual beings. He knows, he sees Lucifer, he knows it's Lucifer. We saw Johannes living back into a previous state of development. He was living into the way of viewing nature, the way of his relationship to Maria. He was in a, um, this was all, it, it was a reverie that of the state of soul that preceded an event which occurred in, I believe it's the second drama, when Maria realized that she had an unhealthy relationship with Johannes. That it was partly her fault that she had created a dependency upon him, his dependency on her, and she, it was a, she, she got pleasure out of it. He adored her. You know, I mean, it's understandable. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't right. And she, she got it. And then she created a distance so that he could develop what he needed to develop independently. So Johannes is living back into the old Maria before she had that realization the old Johannes, and um, this was also before his double revealed that his adoration of Maria was not so 
Michael Noble is he thought that it was actually filled with subconscious desire for her. I mean, there was a lot that he had, that he had, that had gone on since that previous state. He's not a young man anymore when you see him in the fourth drama, but he's feeling as if he were. And this, I want to point out, is this reverie is not the same as the exercise that <laughs> <laughs> That's what we witness on the stage. So, um, does Johannes have a weak will? I think that's this. In the fourth scene, we actually learn that it's not a problem of will.
us is as yet untransformed. That's the gift that the double brings to us. It's our teacher. double says, I must now lead you to my sovereign Lord. So the double actually has an intimate relation to the guardian of the threshold. And he does lead him to the guardian. And the guardian tells him, you see myself. taken hold of your whole being. Make strong the words of power that you know. Their spirit strength will conquer your delusion. So, he says, overcome your desires. He says that very directly. Spirit peacefulness has not yet taken hold of your whole being and make strong the words of power that you know. So he doesn't need new information. He already has what he needs. What are the words of power? He doesn't say which, one, which ones are they. So I had to think, what are the words of power that I know? The beginning of the gospel. Verses by Rudolf Steiner. So I wanted to share with you something that I think is relevant both to the spirit peacefulness and to this, these words of power. It's a verse that I um, work with just personally, and if you all I'm sure work with other ones or the same one. It begins. sets of seven lines, and it's relevant to this spirit peacefulness. Quiet I bear within me, I bear within myself forces to make me strong. Now will I be imbued with these forces warm. Now will I permeate myself power of my will. Now the next seven lines. And I will feel how quiet pours itself through all my being when I become strong to find within myself the strength of inner quiet through the power of my striving. So you don't get quiet by kind of working out or letting go. The quiet comes from the power of my will and the power of my striving. And we know from Rudolf Steiner that actually the ego only becomes manifest in activity. That's when the ego becomes present, is when it's being active. So this verse has that as the key. 
But to find this spirit peacefulness, we have to actually become active. And so we see the difference between spirit peacefulness and relaxation. For I have allowed in laziness my soul to use in twilight comfort. And I think this, I think it's relevant to us because so often when we feel stressed, you know, in a high state of activity, we know we need to somehow not keep going on that track, we, we have to find that spirit peacefulness, what do we do? And the, um, I noticed that people tend to seek relaxation, thinking that will be the antidote to that kind of stress, but it's actually in another direction that we have to look. And I'm even going to go out on a limb here and say, I noticed, I mean, there's the one thing when you have someone kind of like does a midlife crisis thing, but another is just when people like go to the movies. They, or they, they, they choose a form of relaxation that relates to a past state of consciousness, a passive one. And they think that by being passive, they will recoup their forces. But actually, it's not like that. It's through activity that we recoup our forces, or that we come into the stream of activity, which is like a fountain. It's an unending fountain. And we witness that in Maria and Benedictus. We experience the fountain, the unending, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a reality. That's what will keep us going. And we come to it through the activity Felix describes the mystic path that he follows. And it, you'll see it's a man cannot attain the spirit world by wanting to unlock it through his seeking. To strive for nothing. Wake in peaceful stillness. One, one's inmost being filled with expectation. That is the mystic mood. Our outer work cannot endure his mood. And after Tapasius has had this experience, he now also concurs. But Strother feels the opposite. He says, but spirit vision rises in me only when I devote myself to thoughts of action. So his motivation is to build an earthly home for spirit deeds, which can then radiate light and warmth back into the spirit world. Okay, now I'm going to shift. That was my segue to Strada. Now I'm going to go. Um, and here I think we do need a little bit of a retrospective um, of the previous dramas, because he if we've seen the previous dramas, we know Strother. In the first scene of the first drama, he is part of the same conversation um, after the lecture by Benedictus. And he, through what he says, it's revealed that he is unable to see the divine in nature. He's a scientific thinker, and for him, Facts are what make an impression. And, um, and 
And then he gets a fact that contradicts his whole worldview, and that is Theodora, the seeress, comes in and has a spiritual experience right before his very eyes. And that shatters his worldview. It, 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 it cracks it open. Because now there's something that didn't fit. But it was a fact. He couldn't deny it. And there's another experience he has later in the plays when Johannes Timasius paints a portrait of Cephasius and he reveals through this painting the essential core of Cephasius' being. Something of his own being shines through more than the physical presence of Cephasius, his friend, who he's quite familiar with. So something through the artist's work revealed something that was true to Cephasius' nature, but he can't see it physically. That, was, that gave him a second shock, and it actually made him sick. He becomes ill after that because his whole worldview is now called into question and in his illness, 